14. Hallelujah. Sorry, buddy. 1 Corinthians 14. And um, we'll get started where we're going here this morning. Um, and then also, and I forgot to, to... Oh, we're already online, aren't we? Ah, it's all good. 1 Corinthians 14. Um, just want to say greetings to everybody watching online. Thank you guys for, for joining in with us here this morning. Uh, we appreciate y'all. We're in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, what God really laid on my heart is, um, you know, how many of you know there, there are certain things in your life that need regular uh, servicing and maintenance, you know? Um, we probably are going to want to close that door now that they're all out there just because they'll be, they'll be young people and they'll be loud and it'll be fine. But um, how many of you guys know that there are things in your life that need regular maintenance? And, and what I'm talking about, how many know that, that you got to get uh, an oil change on a pretty regular basis in your car, right? Uh, because if you don't, then uh, it's not going to work properly. And uh, there are certain things that need tuning. There are certain things that need maintenance. And, um, you know, and for example, like when we did, when we did worship here this morning, you know, you got to take a little bit of time and you got to, you know, you got to tune the guitar. Um, you got to get it ready uh, to be used. And, and how many know you've got to, you know, Johnny, you got to tune the guitar on a regular basis. You know, you can't, it'd be great if you could just tune the guitar once and be done. Um, it'd be great if you could um, get an oil change one time and it'd be done. But it's something that you have to do regularly. And how many know, how many know relationships are like that too? You know, you get busy and stuff like that, and uh, you need to kind of reconnect. You know, I know that it's like that with me and my wife. It's like that with me and my son. Um, you know, and even can be like that with friends too. You know, you just get so busy that you kind of, you just, there, there needs to be this reconnection point where communication happens again. And so, you know, we have different things in our life that it needs, it needs kind of a tuning up. And, and, and what God really laid on my heart today is, is to talk about, talking about your, your mind, your emotions, um, your thoughts. How many know that sometimes your thoughts can get kind of crazy? And your thoughts and your emotions can get kind of crazy. And that can be something that, that, that goes on. But how many know God didn't, didn't create you to live your life uh, with constantly dealing with crazy emotions, constantly dealing with crazy thoughts? Um, he doesn't want you to live like that, you know? Uh, he wants you... The default setting of a Christian is peace. And um, that's the way God wants you to live your life, is in a place of peace. And, and so periodically, we're going to need a tune-up in our emotions. We're going to need a tune-up in our thoughts. And um, in order for us to, to just enjoy life. You know? And so this is something that God has for us. And, and in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33... It says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. I mean, no, God doesn't want you living in a state of confusion. God doesn't want, to li want you living in a state of being wigged out. And so, uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. God has, has laid out a way um, for us to kind of tune things up a little bit and, and to help you. How many know that there's a battle going on? You know, you have an enemy. And, and so, and, and if you look at, you know, you know, the Calvary, how many know Jesus has won the war? You know, the war is over. God has already defeated the enemy and stripped him of all power, all authority. And so we're living in a state of victory. But how many know there's still battles going on? And so, um, you know, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, how many know as far as your spirit is concerned, you've been made the righteousness of God? Amen. So you're not, you're not, you know, and that's, that's, that's a very important reality, but you're not trying to make yourself more right with God. Um, you don't have the ability to make yourself less right with God. The finished work of the cross has sealed your spirit. And the one thing you can be confident in is that Jesus did a great job on the cross. Amen. So your sin has been forgiven. You've been made the righteousness of God. It's done right here. But how many know your battles here? It's right here. It's the emotions. It's your, uh, it's your thoughts. And, and, in, and in that sense, Jesus won the war and it's finished in our spirit. But how many know your mind, um, a part of your mind is your responsibility? How many know God can't make you think His thoughts? You know? 
uh, we, we have a choice and we have a decision. And, you know, Christy was sharing this earlier on what we focus on. You know, and, and so we, when, in the world we live in, you need a retuning in of your thoughts and your emotions so that you can have clarity and not live in confusion, okay? Because there is a battle going on, and that battle is primarily in the mind. And so, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about this warfare. And in verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for, for, for pulling down strongholds, for casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so it says the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. What does that mean? Like you can't punch the devil, you can't shoot the devil, you can't chop the devil. Um, you don't have this carnal uh, physical weapons, but what you do have is the ability to control what you're thinking. Okay? And, and if we can have focus in our thinking, then how many know that's going to affect our feeling? And your, your thinking and your feeling go very closely related there. And now take a step further. We're not really going to address the concept of a stronghold this morning, but I will talk about it. A stronghold is when you spend a lot of time thinking a certain way. And what happens is it, it develops into a perception. You know, I used to see myself as a drug addict. I used to see myself as a loser. I used to see myself as an addict. I had to tear that stronghold down with God's truth. Okay? And when there's a stronghold in our thinking, uh, what, what happened, you know, how many know that in the carnal mind, you can think the same thing? Depression was a huge thing for me. You know, and, and I was so wrapped up in a certain thought process of failure and a, th a certain thought process that it had become a stronghold in my mind, and I couldn't even see myself as being a happy person. I couldn't even see myself as being anything but depressed. And so a stronghold is when we've thought a certain way for so long. Now, the Bible says that God's truth is mighty in that it will tear that stronghold down, and in its place, God will place truth. I mean, you know, truth always brings freedom. And um, God wants to, us to be free, and He wants us to have freedom. And so we, 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 with truth, tear those strongholds down. But then it goes on, and so I don't want to focus too much on strongholds right now. But what I do want to focus on is bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. God has a way where we can take truth, and that truth will combat and bring us into a place where we're not believing lies. Can I get an Amen. You don't want to, we don't want lies. We don't want to believe lies. We don't want to embrace lies. Why? Because lies always bring destruction. They bring confusion. We want truth. Truth is what brings freedom. Truth is what brings liberty. And so there is this warfare in the mind. How many know, and this, you see this a lot, how many know you can have a, have a um, say a teenage girl, and she's beautiful, but she believes she's ugly? How many know if she believes she's ugly, even though she's beautiful, she's going to experience all the lies that go along with that. Or you can take, you can, you know, you can take, you know, my background, you know, didn't, I didn't grow, you know, I was raised by a single mom and we didn't have a lot of money. And, uh, you know, there's a, we were poor. Like I didn't have the cool shoes. I didn't have all of, you know, not saying that you have to be like that if you're, if you're a single mom and you're raising a child by any means. But for me, that was my experience. And so, when, and the thing about poverty is it brings destruction because you know what it did? It made me feel like I wasn't worth anything. It made me feel like I didn't have much value because of the absence of money. Now, how many know that that's a lie? But if I believe that, then that lie is going to be my experience. And so, God wants to always bring us into greater and greater degrees of freedom, bring truth into our lives so that we can have liberty and we're not operating in an emotional confusion or in thought confusion. You know, what, would, what causes a person to kill somebody? Well, how I many know it's a series of thoughts? You know, what, what, what causes someone to commit adultery? 
How many know it's a series of thoughts? It doesn't happen like this. It happens through a series of time of, of thinking the wrong things and thinking the wrong things and believing the wrong things to where you start to believe something's a lie. How many know people do crazy stuff? And the reason they do crazy stuff is they're believing lies. How many know there are Christians that do crazy stuff? Why are they doing crazy stuff? They believe lies. And so what we need is truth. And so let's turn to, to, to Matthew chapter 4. And what we want is truth. And, and, and so what will help you to know what's real and what's fake. You know, they teach people um, when they're dealing with counterfeits and they teach people how to know what's a real $100 bill and what's a fake $100 bill. How I many know they spend time looking at the real thing? And so if they spend time looking at the real thing, it will help them to find out what's fake and what's not right. Okay? And so God has given to us truth so that we'll know what's true and what's lies. And periodically, your, our head, our thoughts and our emotions, we need a recalibration, a retuning to what's true and what's right so we don't get wrapped up in crazy stuff. And, and if you look, this is how Jesus handled warfare. It's how Jesus handled fighting the enemy. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 uh, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. And when the tempter came to tempt him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered him and said, Now look at how Jesus handled it. This is really important. He said, It is written. Now how many know Jesus, as the Word of God, could have rebuked the devil any way he wanted to? But he chose to use what was written. Why did he choose to use what was written? Because each time the enemy attacks him, he goes back to what's written. And the reason he did that was because, how many know that that's what you and I have to do? We have to go to what's written. Truth. So that when I open up Psalm 23... How many of you know it says the same thing every single time I open it up? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack, I shall not want. Though I walk through the, through, through the valley, though I will not fear evil. Uh, and, and so what happens is, is that Scripture, what is written, becomes an anchor to my soul so that when crazy stuff is going on around me, I can go back to truth and I can go back to, no, 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 this is what God said. How I many know oh, that's a tremendous thing? That's a tremendous power. Because you're going to need that in the storms of life. Because how I many know oh, you're not going to always feel in line with what is true? How I many know oh, you're not always going to think in line with what is true? And see, and one of, one of the things I see happening happen a lot in the body of Christ, and I think it's very unfortunate, people tossing the Bible out, man. They're tossing the Bible out and saying, ah, we don't need this anymore. And, and, and if you toss the Scripture out, if you toss the Word out, uh, it's just a matter of time before you leave Christianity. It's just a matter of time before you walk away from Jesus. And, um, and now look, I understand the Bible... Not perfectly translated. I understand you. You know how many know that there are things that are written. There are things that are written under the old covenant. There are things that are written under the new covenant. There are things. But so when you're studying scripture, how many know you got to be like the Bereans and be more noble and search those things out whether they be true. You know we we live in a time where we have every tool where we can study the Greek. We can study the Hebrew. We have different translations. We have the ability... And see, and here's the beauty of it. You're not left with just some dusty old book. How many know you've got the Holy Ghost? you got the Spirit of God. And so you take the Spirit of God and the tools that we have, and you allow God to reveal truth to you. Don't let anybody convince you to take Scripture and throw it out because it doesn't line up with what they think or what they believe. Because at that point, truth becomes relative, and there is no truth. And then what happens is, people, they, they live in a state of confusion. 
They live in a state of no anchor. They live in a state of being freaked out and their thoughts are crazy and their emotions are crazy. Why? They don't have any anchor of truth any longer. And I think it's a really sad thing that the enemy has managed to try to steal Scripture from the people of God. There's a reason we have a Bible. Now look, the Bible's not God. The Bible is not... uh, It is a... If you take a look at everything that has been done in order to preserve that book for you, you'd be astonished at how many people have died trying to keep that book alive. Why? The enemy didn't want what was written to be passed to us. And um, certainly, Jesus is not some dusty old book, but Jesus expresses Himself through Scripture. You know, when I got saved, when I came to the Lord, it was... Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not of. That scripture with the power of God's Spirit was highlighted into my life and it brought me into the kingdom. And so Jesus, when he's fighting the devil, he doesn't just pull a concept out of his pocket, even though he could have because he's the word of God and whatever he says is scripture. He said, let me go back and let me find what is written so that the people in the future will have a weapon to fight when the warfare comes. because So he says, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so how many know the devil's like, okay, you want to use Scripture? Let me use some too. You have to understand that the enemy, how many know some of the greatest atrocities that have ever happened into this, on this planet have been as a result of twisted Scripture? The, some of the worst abuses that have ever happened to me personally, uh, on a larger, grander scale, uh, people have died and been murdered and killed um, over twisted Scripture. And the way the enemy deceived Adam and Eve was he twisted what God said. He took everything that God said and put one little twist on it. So subtle. What did he say? God knows that when you... God, see, and immediately when the twist happened... She thought God said we couldn't touch the fruit. God never said you couldn't touch the fruit. So when she touched the fruit and nothing happened, it gave her confidence to take a step further and take a bite. But the enemy took the words of God and sent them back to Eve and took one slight twist on it, and it was the foundation of her error. She was, they were pursuing wisdom, and that's how they fell. Interesting, isn't it? And so what's the enemy do? He does the same thing to Jesus right here. He says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. What's happening? The devil's about to uh, quote some scripture. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone, Jesus said to him. And then Jesus said to him, It is written, again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so the enemy's trying to use scripture to tempt Jesus And Jesus does not retaliate with anything other than what is written. Why? There's power in what is written. Okay? And I understand the letter kills. I understand that you can take this book and you can take Scripture and you can absolutely destroy somebody with it. If if, if the Spirit of God... How many know the Bible says the letter kills? But the Spirit gives life. It takes the Scripture and the Spirit of God to come together to produce Christ vocalized in the earth. But just, you know, you know, we don't get rid of the knives in our house because someone can use a knife incorrectly. You know what I'm saying? We don't get we don't get rid of, you know, you know, just because something can be used incorrectly doesn't mean that we get rid of it. And yes, people can hurt with scripture, but how many know with scripture you can heal? And you can have a solid foundation of truth. And so he goes on, and the enemy tempts him again, and once again, Jesus said, it is written. Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And so I want to say to you, the way you calibrate, the way you tune up your thoughts and your emotions is with what is written. The Word of God, and we're going to look at it in Hebrews, it's the only thing that will divide between soul and spirit. It's amazing. That's where we're, we're moving forward. It has this unique ability Um, to show you what's of your spirit, what's from God, and what's of your emotions and your soul. Amen. Because how many know people rise up and say crazy stuff in the name of God? 
You know, like I was just, I was ministering in uh, Louisiana last weekend and this lady was, uh, someone was talking to me about someone who's, who told someone else that, that someone's husband was really their husband. You know, God told me that's my husband. You know, it's like, and, and you know, and when someone says, well, God said, you know, what are you supposed to say? Well, it's like, okay, let's go to scripture and let's see if it's in the book. Hmm, looks like that's fornication and adultery and not good. That's not in the book. And so we can't back up what you're saying with Scripture. God ain't going to give somebody else somebody else's husband. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, or, or, or you know, people will try to take God said and back up all kinds of crazy stuff and if it's and if it's not in Scripture, then we can't em- we can't embrace it, you know. Um, and now, in the very same breath, I understand people can take Scripture and twist it and make people do all kinds of crazy stuff too. And that's why, and I say this all the time, your own personal relationship with God is more important. You hear God for you better than anybody else does. If someone's saying speaking something into your life and it doesn't bear witness with your spirit and your heart, set it aside. Amen. But Scripture is where we hear truth, calibrate, tune up our thoughts and our emotions to what is real and what is true. How many know the enemy is always trying to make good evil and evil good? It's insane. Some of the things that are embraced as being good. And it's like, but that's what the enemy does and that's fine. But the the truth of Scripture is the place where we keep, we stay on the right page with what God is saying, with what, what, what God wants. And so, Ephesians chapter 6, we hear a lot about the armor of God. You know, we've studied it, talking about the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and all of these things. But I want to pull out one piece of this armor, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And if you'll drop down to the bottom, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, truth, how many know that as a soldier, if you got no belt, then you're about to lose? <laughs> Your belt is what keeps everything else together, okay? And, uh, you know, especially in the times that they were in, they had to have something that would gird up their loins. They had to have something that was going to keep everything, you know, together. And truth is the... I mean, that's how you beat the enemy. It's truth. And that's one of the beauties of the gospel because the gospel is going to reveal to you your worth, the fact that you're righteous, that God loves you and God is for you and what your true identity is. Man, if you can just find out who you are, all these lies that the enemy tried to bring against you, they fall to the ground. Because you're like, you know what? That's not who I am. I may have acted like that. I may have failed like that. I may have made a mistake, but that doesn't define me. My Savior defines me. Can I get an amen? And so that truth becomes a weapon that you take a stand on in the day of evil when the enemy's trying to come against you. And then in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, if you guys want to turn there or pull it up on the screen, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, rest, and hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the loins of your mind. What does it mean? How many know that you truth is what is going to gird... How many know your mind is the place of production? You have to... It is the place of conceiving. How many know you got to think it before you're going to do it? And, and the reality is, is you don't have to think every thought that everything ever, that flies through your head. You don't have to think the way the world thinks. You don't have to let Hollywood, Hollywood define for you what is morality or a sitcom define for you what is morality. How many know we want to go to Scripture for our moral compass and for what is true... And this right here, truth, is what keeps you gird up the loins of your mind. How many know one of the defining characteristics of someone who's insane is they cannot filter their thoughts? Whatever comes into their head, they believe is true. Okay? And, um, and there was a time in my life when I, when I was like that. When I was involved in drugs and stuff like that. And, and I thought some crazy stuff. And now... I have truth that I can gird up, you know, because there was a time in my life where, and I argued for it emphatically in the public school system that truth was relative and there's no such thing as truth. Man, I'd lay it out and I'd argue against it and all that. And uh, that road is not a good road. It's not freedom, it's actually bondage. But now, um, I now know what truth is, it's what God says. And so now, this brings a place of strength. And how many know that you can now gird up the loins of your mind with truth? 
What did God say about it? Man, there's tremendous. You know, when you're facing a battle, when you're facing something, you know, we're, as a family, one of the, what we're facing right now. I mean, you know, I've got to go to what Scripture says. And I've got to see, what's God say about this? All right, this is what God says. That's why I'm going to hang my hat. That's why I'm going to hang my hope. That's going to be my confidence. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Amen. Because there's going to be times when you don't understand why things are happening the way they're happening. There's going to be times when your thoughts are crazy, your emotions are crazy, and you need Scripture to ground you. N- news won't ground you. Sports won't ground you. Movies won't ground you. you scripture <laughs> will ground you. Bring it in. Listen to it. Listen to it on audio, audio Bible or, or sit, spend some time reading the Scriptures or Whatever way works best for you, but you, you and I, all of us, we need a recalibration. We need a retuning. Because what happens is, just like that guitar is going to get, un, it's going to untune itself over time, how many know it's going to happen no matter what? You know, it, just like a, a car is going to need a fresh oil change, it's going to happen no matter what. Well, this world is going to try to impact the way you think. If you look at the gross immorality that we currently see being embraced by the masses, it happened initially by small increments of entertainment. Just a little bit, just a little bit here and there. That's how it happens. Just to just a little bit, oh, that's okay. No, that's okay. And then if you look at the moral slide from the 50s to now, it's been a progressive movement of this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. To where now, things that we know are wrong are being openly embraced as right. And things that are right are, are, are openly being accused as wrong. But it didn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen in a moment. It happened uh, through small increments. And so, for all of us, we got to stay tuned up on what's right and what's true and what's real. And it, and it happens through Scripture, man. Scripture is going to help you, and it's going to retune in your mind and retune in your emotions, and that's why the Bible says it's daily bread. Daily bread, amen? And so, uh, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, so there's just a recalibration, you know, and different things work for different people. And I know you can get legalistic with this, and I know people can, you know, I'm a firm believer that you can't force relationship. Um, you can't make somebody have a relationship. I don't. I don't believe that. Uh, uh, I'm. I'm very careful to not do that with my kids. Um, I, I think that you have to be careful with those type of things. And everyone's different, and everyone has different personalities. All households are different. But I know. I can promise you this: if you spend time in God's truth, it's going to make your life better. <laughs> You're going to be happier. You have more peace. You have more clarity, you know. I'm at a time in my life where I'm really maximizing audio Bible. Like, that's just what's working for me. Like, I got this app called Dwell, and uh, if you don't have it, it's a great app. Uh, It's, you know, some of these audio Bibles are cheesy, you know. I mean, they are, man. They're all like, I mean, do we have to be that dramatic? And, you know, and and maybe it's your thing. Maybe y'all like the the Charlton Heston dramatic, (laughs) you know, and all that. And if that and that might be your thing, and that might be might might minister to you, and I'm not being critical towards you know because everybody gets ministry different, but uh, it don't work for me. I just think, dear God, this is bad. It's what I think. I, I just think, ooh, you know. But man, you know the one that I have now, it's 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 got five different uh, accents and people reading it, and and so it's good, man. And so when I work out, like when I'm doing some cardio or something like that, I'm listening to Proverbs, you know, or. Uh, when we're when we we just took a trip and did ministry, I'm, I got scripture rolling. And then another thing that I'm just sharing you with what I do. I'm not telling you to do what I do. I'm just sharing you what, with. I'm just giving you a snapshot into what I'm doing that works for me. And it might be something totally different for you. But like uh, when I have a hard time sleeping, you know, if I'm awake in the middle of the night, I'll put in some some earbuds or whatever and just put on some scripture, man. And then it'll kind of it'll you know put me back to sleep. And the whole time I'm hearing truth, and there'll be certain things that'll be highlighted, and then it'll be, oh yeah, that's good. And and because uh, God, He uses Scripture to speak to you, and what'll happen is one of the things He'll do is He'll highlight a portion. It'll be it'll be like, Bing, that's for you. Bing, that's for you. 
And it can be encouragement, it can be edification. And the important thing to know is that all that scripture, you've got to look at it through the lens of the cross. Don't get over under the old covenant getting condemned. There's no condemnation for you. Can I get an amen? There's none. Like back in the day before I understood really the gospel, I'd get into Proverbs and feel really bad about myself. Because if you don't understand Proverbs in light of the cross, then you'll just walk away saying, well, none of those promises are me because I'm not a righteous man. I'm not a righteous woman. But you have to, you have, Jesus is the key. He is the lens. And so now when you listen to Proverbs or you study Proverbs, every one of those promises are yours. Uh, everything it says about a righteous man, a righteous woman, a virtuous woman, that's your stuff. Why? You get it by identity. God gave it to you as a gift through Jesus. But what happens is, is the scripture will calibrate your soul and your thinking to line up with what's already true in your spirit. And that's the beauty of it. Um, so it's a powerful thing when it's done properly. And so, you know, for someone else, they may just sit down and, and you know, do a psalm or, or a proverb or read, read through the Gospels or whatever. Don't allow the enemy to turn this into legalism. How many know God loves you whether you read your Bible or not? How many know you're the righteousness of God whether you read your Bible or not? God's with you. God's for you. Don't, you know, and the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. So don't get into legalism, but at the same time, Let's not be playing a super duper untuned guitar. Let's not be let's not be driving a vehicle that hasn't had oil change in fifty thousand miles. You know what I'm saying? What happens? What happens to to a a, a car that hasn't had oil change in fifty thousand miles? Well, the friction overwhelms it and it causes it to stop. You ever had a time in your life where you're dealing with a lot of friction? What can be some examples of friction? Fear, anger. Offense, um, stress, you know, all of these different things, uh, you need some fresh oil. You need a fresh calibration. And don't allow the enemy to make us think that we're so free that we don't get to enjoy a relationship with God. Amen? Don't allow him to use your freedom against you. Don't allow him to use your liberty against you. The reason you've been set free is so that you can enjoy a relationship with God. You know, I mean, Johnny, what if you never tuned your guitar again? No one would, people would stop asking you to come and lead worship. <laughs> because Johnny's great, man, but that brother's guitar is not tuned, man, you know. And, and we can see that clearly from an instrument, but how many know that your mind's the same way? How many know if you're living angry, you're untuned? I mean, if you're living fearful, you're untuned. Time to tune up. Simple, easy. And here's the beauty of it. You don't have to understand how it works for it to work. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, I mean, you know, when I ask my 13-year-old to wash his hands before we eat, he doesn't have to understand uh, the concept of sanitation and soap and killing of germs and removal. No, no, no. Just wash your hands. With Scripture, you have to understand everything. Just wash, your, just wash your mind. Just let the washing of the water do its thing. I don't have to understand how air conditioning works to enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? Like It's a simple thing. and, and it's, it's, You don't have to understand everything, but if you'll spend... Just think to a time when you spent some quality time in Scripture on a regular basis, how it impacts your life. Aren't you happier? Don't you have more peace? Don't you have more joy? Why? Because you're being, you're being tuned up. But So don't you think the enemy wants you living your life untuned? So what's going to happen when you're going to sit down and try to spend some time in some Scripture and hearing some truth? How many know that phone going to ring? Yeah, it is. And, and then, you know, the, that Facebook notification going to happen. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Why? Enemy's trying to distract you from life. Don't live untuned. Get, stay tuned up. Now, here's the thing. How many know, if, and I'm just your great example this morning, so forgive me. <laughs> How many know if Johnny never tuned his guitar again, every song he sang and every note he played, Father God would love because Father God loves Johnny. Amen. And so if you never pull the scripture out, because I had a season in my life where I didn't read the Bible for a long time because it was shoved down my throat and it was presented to me in legalism, and I couldn't read my Bible. I needed to know that God was going to meet me apart from it. But how I many you know if you never read your Bible or you never hear truth again, and you never 
allow that to happen, how many know God's still going to love you? And how many know you're still on your way to heaven if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? But how many know you're not going to enjoy your life as much? You know? If my son never washed his hands again, <laughs> God help us all. <laughs> how many know God still loves him? I still love him. But how many know that brother going to stink after a while? You know, we're going we gonna to have some funkiness, you know? We had a little funk over vacation time because you get around the ocean, man, you're like, ah, I don't need to take a shower. What are you talking about? We're like, Ethan, how long has it been since you had a shower? He's like, oh. You might need to. <laughs> yeah. So, like, our minds need tuned. Amen? Emotionally and thought wise. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. How many of scriptures inspired by God? Now listen, I know it's not perfectly translated. I know that you have to, uh, there are mistranslations. I know that there are times when um, there are things that we're talking about, things that are cultural. Yeah, I mean, I don't believe for a moment that God supports slavery. I don't believe that. But how many know when, 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 when Philemon was written, it was written to a slave? And so, uh, please understand that when you do sh- study, it uh, wasn't written to a slave, it was written about a slave. Please understand, when you're, when you're studying Scripture, how many know you need to take into con- you need to understand who it's speaking to, the content, the context, so that you can understand what's being said? Man, Paul Ellis wrote an amazing book on the book of Revelations here recently. And it's called The Letters of Jesus. And he goes in and culturally breaks down all of these letters. Because how I many know, you know, you get a revelation of grace, and then you start reading what Jesus has got to say in the book of Revelations, you can be like, well, dang, what's going on here? But if you, understood, but if you understand culturally and the symbolism that's being used, it helps you to understand that every one of those letters was a letter of love and to help the early church. And so, please, so when you're studying this book, when you're scripture, how I many know you got to rightly divide the word of truth? You got to know who it's speaking to. You got to know the culture. You got to know the context. How I many know you got to make sure you ain't trying to live under the old covenant? You go back to the law, your butt's kicked. Don't do that, you know. But at the same time, how I many know we don't rip the Old Testament out of our Bibles and throw it? If you look at Jesus when he ministered to, um, you know, and, and I, we're not going to turn there for sake of time, but in Luke 24, Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 25 through 26. How many know Jesus met some disciples on the road to Emmaus? And they were all bummed out. And Jesus Jesus hid himself. They didn't know who he was. And uh, he was like, what's up? Why are y'all so upset? And and they were like, oh man, don't you know Jesus of Nazareth is dead? And oh my gosh, it's so bad and all that. And he's like, oh yeah, really? Well, tell me about it. (laughs) And then it says, and he beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What did, what did he do? Well, how I many know he didn't have a New Testament to read to him? Still being written. But yet he didn't say, oh man, Moses, that's garbage. Pro- Law of the prophets, that's garbage. Just listen to me. I'm the Christ. I'll speak to you right now. How I many know he went back to, it is written, And by the power of the Spirit of God, He opened to them the Scriptures to find out that everything written back then was actually talking about Him. Can I get an amen? What does that mean? That means that it is written, even though those Scriptures weren't written directly in that... that, How many know Scripture is prophetic? And yes, it speaks to who it's speaking to right at that moment, but how many know it speaks to people thousands of years later? To where I can open up uh, the book of Jeremiah th- thousands of years later the, uh, in a statement that was made by somebody else to somebody else will minister life to me in the 21st century because Scripture is it's alive. <laughs> it's a living thing. And God can bring life, breathe life on it and speak to us right now. So I want to show you, Jesus went back to the Old Testament Scriptures and revealed Himself. And then, it, and then we'll take it a step further, and for sake of time, we won't turn there, but then when the eunuch 
uh, Candace's eunuch was, uh, was, in, was in the chariot, and Philip the evangelist was translated and brought before the eunuch. The eunuch was there and was reading out of the book of Isaiah and said, you know, this, the, you know the lamb shall go you know, before the sheep shears and this and that and this and reading Isaiah. And Philip comes up and says, hey man, do you know what you're reading? He's like, no, what is it? What is it? So he took that scripture out of Isaiah. You know what he did? He uncovered it, unpacked it, and by the Spirit of God said, this time about Jesus. And he was like, I'm ready to get saved. And then he got saved and he got baptized right there. As a result of taking what is written and allowing the Spirit of God to open the eyes so that we can see Jesus. How many of this whole book is about Jesus? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Good news. Amen. And so 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 1, and, um, and it's just important to understand this. Don't allow people to devalue Scripture. It will tune you up. It will show you what's true. It will show you what's right. I see so many people treating the Bible like a history book and saying, man, this thing's just not for today. This is not for today. This is not for today. And then they throw out Scripture. And then next thing you know, what's truth? Well, you know what truth is? Whatever they say. If they got enough charisma, they got a big enough platform, whatever they say is truth. See, to me, that's a fable. If you, it, it doesn't even matter how, how logical it is or how compelling it is. If it does not line up with Scripture, then we're three clicks away from crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, how many cults... Did I say that properly? <laughs> Good. All I need is one nod. I don't need three. Just one. I just need one person. Did I say it wrong? I did. Steve said I said it right. That's all that matters. <laughs> I'm now confident. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm trying to say. C-U-L-T-S. Colts. Stop. Quit laughing at me. I said it wrong that time? Irrelevant. <laughs> Moving forward. How many know they all start... How many know many of them started with Scripture? I mean, old Jim Jones started with Scripture. Many of these things, they started with Scripture. But what happens is, when you start to move away from Scripture, then you don't have any parameters for truth any longer. And then, you know, I was watching a documentary about Jim Jones, and he took the book, took the Bible, and threw it across it. All you need is me. See, now we have a problem. We have a problem now, because you've, you've taken truth and laid it aside, and it, you've exalted yourself into the position of truth. And so now we don't have what is written to balance your charisma. We don't have what is... Because was the man called? Yes. Was the man gifted? Yes. But when you take Scripture and you throw it out, you're in a bad place. You know, and, there, and there's, you know, and, and there's other... You know, the... the and, geez. You know, and then the other guy who's in somewhere in Florida, and he's like a, a, a cult leader, and he's, you know, and, and he started out with a revelation of grace. But now they've moved away from Scripture, and now there's no such thing as sin. Everything's okay. You do whatever you want. So now they're all having sex with each other. They're, they're drinking. They're doing drugs. They're doing whatever they want to do under a banner of what they say is grace. How many of y'all, that's not Bible. How many of y'all, that's not freedom. No, it's not. Sin, the dominion of sin is not freedom. But how does someone get from enjoying the freedom and liberty of Christ into licentiousness and craziness and cults and all that? Well, they're going to have to step away from Scripture. That's the only way. It's the only way it happens. And so we can't do that, you know? And you know, and, and I and I and I find myself having conversations with people, and you know, they're like, "Well, you know, they're you know this and that," and I'm like, "Well, but Scripture says that." Oh, yeah, but that's that's just that, and I'm just like, "Okay, game over, see ya." Conversation's finished at that point. I have no place to talk to them any longer, unfortunately, because now it's just their humanistic, logical opinion versus what I'm saying out of Scripture. Now, please understand, and I'm not saying this either. I'm not saying that. I mean, you know, when you have Scripture and you're embracing Scripture, it doesn't mean that, you're, that you understand and are saying everything right. I guarantee you, all of us in here, we believe things that are wrong. Because we're people. But we try, and we seek, 
and we pursue, and we, we allow the Spirit of God to show us truth, but we don't have this whole thing figured out, right? Is there any person on this planet that has this whole thing figured out? No, there's not, and there never will be. But if I can at least have a foundation of Scripture and truth, I can recognize and stay calibrated and tuned up into what's right and what's wrong. Are you all tracking me here? There's safety in Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we a couple more places and we close. It says, this is Peter talking here. He says, For we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, when we were with him on the holy mount. Now, I want to stop here for just a moment and say this. He had, how many know it would have been a powerful experience to be there when God spoke out of heaven concerning his son? It been cool to be there, right? But what I want you to understand is, and what he goes on to say is, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein until you do well that you take heed as a light that shines in a dark place, the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is in, of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but by the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What's he saying here? He's saying, we were there when we heard God speak, but we have a more sure word. What is he talking about? He said, I'm talking about what was written. He exalted what was written above his experience. Why? Because how many know people can have experiences? You know, that's where the, the Mormon church came from. They had an experience. Come a hair throwing the Mormon Bible away, away in a hotel room. I, I didn't know because it was wrong, but I wanted to. Because you open it up and you got the Mormon Bible and, and the Bible. And I just wanted to be like, clink. But I, that's defamation of property and it's wrong. And so it wasn't mine, so I didn't do it. I thought about it. <laughs> but how many know that person had an experience? Yeah, and then, you know, if you, and even if you look at Muhammad, how many know Muhammad had an experience? You know, and, and you look at Jehovah Witness and you look at all of these other things, they're defined by an experience. And Peter, who had the most, one of the most powerful experiences ever, said, we have a, my experience was awesome, but what is written is a more sure word of prophecy. Why is he saying that? Because Scripture is an anchor to our soul. It's truth, man. And the reason God recorded it, the reason God had it the way He did, is so that we would not fall prey um, to deception. Amen. And so... And please understand, by me saying that, I'm not saying, let's have experiences, amen? Let's, ha let's, let's come to visions and revelations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's hear words from God. Let's, let's have experiences. Let's, I, don't, I don't downplay or belittle any of the prophetic. We want all of that. But if someone comes up and prophesies to me, yea, yea, thus saith the Lord, this is your wife, not this is your wife. I mean, I'm going to be like, oh, that ain't in the book, bro. You know what I'm saying? Or thus says the Lord, you know, you need to do, you know, or what, or I'm trying to think of another example of someone saying something crazy besides just that example, but that one is clearly, we know that's dumb, you know? And, but there are other examples where that's, that I'm, I'm going to weigh it with scripture. I'm not going to let someone's personal charisma draw me away from what is written. God did not spend this much time and this much energy preserving something in the earth that would keep us so that we could go running after charismatic fables of people who are not honoring Scripture. It's a safe place. Amen? And, and, but there's a balance. We want to have the experiences. We want to have all of these amazing things that God does for us, but we want to make sure that it's balanced with what he's already spoken. Okay? Now, let's, um, we'll go to uh, uh, two more places and we close here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So, Scripture will retune you, recalibrate you, bring you out of confusion, bring you into a place of sound mind. Um, it, it, it's good to have it coming into your life. It's good to, 
to be uh, just enjoying it, you know. And, uh, and I know legalism, legalism will try to rob you of that. Legalism will try to rob you of Scripture. It'll try to rob you of evangelism. It'll try to rob you of giving. It'll try to rob you of prayer. It'll try to rob you of church attendance. Legalism will try to rob you from all those things. Why? Because you did them for the wrong reasons and you did them for a person rather than for God. But uh, I'm not going to let legalism take anything else from me. You know? And the key is that the motive behind what you're doing is right. How many know there's nothing wrong with reading your Bible? How many know there's nothing wrong with evangelism? There's nothing wrong with church attendance or giving or any of these things, but they must be done out of a state of knowing that you're loved, not out of a state of trying to be loved or trying to be accepted. Amen. But um, 1 Thessalonians gives us some insight into why we need Scripture to recalibrate us. We need Scripture to retune us. It says, now the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 4, please. Um, how many know that you are a three-part being? Um, you, 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 your spirit, soul, and body. Father God is a triune being. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, you are, you have three parts. And it's really important to understand that because if you don't understand that, it's going to be difficult for you to understand why you are the way you are. Um, you know, when Jesus conquered the devil, and when you called out upon the name of the Lord, when you believed, how many of your spirit got born again? You became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But for some of us that weren't raised in good environments, how many know our head was still crazy? And so now, my spirit man is alive with God. And, and my flesh still has the propensity to desire sin. But my flesh is not who I am. It's not my identity, nor is it yours. Paul talks about that in, in Romans chapter 7. But then the deciding factor is my soul. It's my mind, my will, and my emotions. Your soul is the one that really is in the driver's seat. Okay, Your spirit's really not in the driver's seat yet. Your soul is. How many of your soul, your thinker, your chooser, your feeler, makes all, calls all the shots? Your soul decides whether it's going to partner with flesh and do something dumb, or your soul is going to partner with the Spirit and do something good. Okay, Your, your chooser is in the soul. And so we've been talking about the impact that Scripture has on our emotions and on our thoughts and on our soul. Because what will happen is, Scripture will cause your soul to line up with the witness of your spirit so that Christ can have an expression in the earth. The kingdom of God can have expression of love and peace and joy and kindness and all these wonderful things because just because I got saved didn't mean the battle was over for my personal life. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, when I got saved, I was on my way to heaven. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but how many of you know, I still thought like a drug addict. And until I renewed my mind to the fact that I'm not a drug addict, Friday night would roll around and it'd be a real challenge for me. So I had to renew my mind to the new me. And that's where the Scripture came in. That's where the Word came in. And that's where the mind renewal began to take place. But in closing, in Hebrews chapter 4, we find out something that Scripture does that nothing else on earth can do. It says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God speak." No, no, no. That's the wrong translation. Yeah, here we go. There's the right one. Uh, For the Word of God is living and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, The Word of God has the ability to divide between soul and spirit. What does that mean? When I'm taking the Word in, it can show me what's God and what's just my emotions can show me what's God and just a thought. Okay? Because it divides between soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so, if I just like if I'm going to take water and wash my hands regularly and my hand stays clean, how I many you know my mind needs a washing of the water of the Word so that I can see clearly, so that I can think clearly, so that the real me can have expression in the earth. Because if I, if, if I don't wash my mind, how many of y'all, this world's going to dirty your mind up? It's everywhere, man. Everywhere. Every form of entertainment, it's, 
just the spirit of this world is here. Now, understand, I don't think you should seclude yourself and separate yourself and go be the city of light on the hill and not have any doings, doings or dealings with anybody in the world. I don't believe that's what the kingdom is called to do. How many know the kingdom is leaven that's been placed in the bread? How many know you are supposed to be around people that need Jesus? Amen. And being in this world, you're going to see things and hear things that might not be, that aren't the kingdom of God. But the gospel will continually wash your conscience clean from guilt and condemnation. Amen. It's important to understand. You're the righteousness of God. It's important to understand that you're forgiven. It's important to understand there's no condemnation and that you're loved. It's important to hear that continually because you're in a, you're in a world that's going to constantly try to detune you from the frequency of heaven. It's going to try to detune you. Now, sadly enough, man-made religion has the loudest detuning fork. What is the detuning fork of man-made religion? Condemnation. If you, embrace, if you think God's mad at you and you think you're not forgiven and you think God's against you and you hear that from unfortunately other Christians and preachers and pastors and leaders, that's not, that's not the frequency of the kingdom. That'll make, you, that'll, that'll make you feel when you're reading the Bible rather than getting fed, you'll be condemned. Rather than enjoying revelation, enjoying relationship with the Father, uh, you'll, you'll walk away feeling bad about yourself like you're unworthy and you're not good enough. You need to work harder and try more and be more. That, that'll, that's not the yoke of Jesus. The yoke of Jesus is easy and light. That's the yoke of legalism. It will kill you. Many of us have come out of that. So we don't want the man-made religion to detune us from the frequency of God's righteousness and grace and love. Can I get an Amen. But then we also don't want to get detuned by the spirit of this world where, you know, you ever just get around someone who's super duper angry? I had this happen to me a few weeks ago. And this person was so angry that I ended up being angry too. And I'm not even an angry person. I'm not. I mean, I have things I deal with, but anger is not really one of them. But you know what? I was mad. And, uh, but what happened? Their frequency of anger got on me. And it detuned me into a state of anger. How many of you know social media will try to do that to you? Try to live mad. No, no, don't do that. Don't live mad. Look, take a stand for injustice. Take a stand for truth, but do it in a place of peace. Amen. Peace is your default setting. And I'm not saying there's not a time to be angry. How many of you know there's, not, there's nothing sinful about being angry? How many of you know there's a righteous indignation? But the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. What does that mean? That means that you're not created to live angry. If you live angry, you're going to be tired. You don't need that. You don't need that. And so, this world's going to try to detune you, but, and man-made religion will try to detune you, but the Word of God, it'll, it'll, it'll bring a clarity. It'll, it'll wash you of confusion. It'll bring a wholeness to your life that is worth more than anything else. It's worth more than anything else. It's worth more than the news, than sports, than movies. It brings you into your best, just life's better. You know, there's a wisdom in it. You know, the Bible talks about in Proverbs that, that when, the, when the edge is sharp, it's easy to chop the tree down. You know, talking about the edge of the axe. And that's what wisdom is. How I many you know we want to be sharp? and alert and spirit-led when we're dealing with our family? How I many you know we want to be alert and sharp and spirit-led when we're dealing with the world? We want it all the time. How do we stay sharp? Man, truth. Truth, man. Hearing, hearing Scripture. So, it, so what we want to do, we want to hear Scripture, and then we want to, how many you know we want to hear teaching? But you want to hear teaching that's based on Scripture. You don't want to hear people teaching stuff that's not scriptural. I mean, I do. I mean, that's where I'm at. You know, I mean, if, if, you're, if someone's teaching a bunch of stuff that sounds really logical and really good, but it's not based on Scripture, I'm going to have to go with Scripture over that person's charisma. You know, I'm going to have to. Now, if you can prove it to me in Scripture, I'll embrace it. And how many know you got to stay teachable? That's one of the challenges of people who embrace Scripture so hard. They're like, well, my way or the highway. And then they, they, you can't teach them anything because they, they think they've got it all figured out. 
But the reality is, I mean, we're all learning, and we always will be. But, I, but Scripture, it's that anchor to your soul. In, in, in closing, Psalm 131 and verse 2, it says, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. And your soul needs to be calmed by the truth of God's Word. And here's, and here's the thing. You need to learn how to do it yourself. Yourself. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Because you're not going to all... How I many know, oh, like for example, like my Eli, my year and a half year old, he does not know how to calm himself yet. He doesn't know how. So we have to calm him. You know, he doesn't know how to do it yet. And so we have, have found a myriad of different ways to calm him. <laughs> like when we're traveling in the car, he's like, dear God, why are we still in this car? You know, like what is wrong? So we have different levels of calming, right? So we have this. We know the music that he likes. And we play certain music to try to calm him. If that doesn't work, we do this, we do that, we give him this, we give him that. And then it's funny, the last 15 minutes of the drive back home, we ran out of every calming option. <laughs> He's not calm. My wife's not calm. She's, she's tapped out. I don't even know how she does. I just drive. I just drive. <laughs> I'm the driver. So I drive. I keep us alive. You know what I'm saying? But she handles all everything that goes on in the car and props to her for doing it because I couldn't do it. But she does it. She does a great job. But she's done too. We're all done. And so we have one last option. Uh, the ring pop. <laughs> Pull that ring pop out. Bless God. Give it to Eli. Go, go. He's good. <laughs> Victory. Only lasted about 10 minutes. But it was, it was like the end, you know. And then we only had five more minutes to go and we were fine. But how I many know a child does not know how to calm themselves? But how I many you know as a Christian, we need to learn how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We need to learn how to get off and have our own relationship with the Lord. Now listen, there's no condemnation if you're still learning how to do that. How I many you know the body of Christ is here. We're here to help each other. Can I get an amen? amen? We need each other. Just like me in the beginning of this message, I presented a need that I had. And I wanted you guys to pray with me. We're, we do this life together. But God says, I want you to learn how to do this on your own. Because if you learn how to do this on your own, it's going to help you in your life. Amen? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. We're going to, we're, we're done. Father, we just thank you and, and praise you for, um, for, for teaching us how to tune ourselves in Lord to, to you. And Lord, we just, uh, we thank you for that. We thank you that you help us do it. You teach each person here individually how to do that Lord and give them space and time. Show them Lord, we honor Lord. You said that you exalted your word above your name. And uh, Lord, we, we are not those that just throw the Bible out, Lord, uh, in the name of a false grace, Lord. We, we honor Scripture, and Lord, I thank you that we stay teachable, we stay humble. Spirit of God, we thank you that you continue to lead us and guide us and, and to teach us, Lord. And, but we thank you for that anchor, Lord. Just like Jesus, we say, it is written, it is written, it is written. Lord, we just thank you for that, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.